Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Hello, Susie. Hi, Jill. Good morning. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for the Harvard Extension Alumni Association Saturday Symposium this morning. Uh, my name is Susie Diab. I'm an ALM Management Studies graduate, class of 2015. I serve as the reunion director for the Harvard Extension Alumni Association. And what I can tell you um, so uh, during my time so far is that the uh, HEAA Saturday Symposium is a very popular flagship event um, and traditionally hosted during the uh, Harvard Extension Alumni Weekend. So uh, we're so excited that we have over, uh, you know, hundreds of people who have registered uh, over the course of today and tomorrow, folks from United States, California, Texas, Boston, and across the globe. So we have folks from Australia, UAE, Hong Kong. And uh, I think that's just such an exciting uh, aspect of our uh, alumni. And so while it's, you know, we have this global reach, I think what's so unique and so special about our community is that we're still able to make, you know, strong connections, strong ties with our alumni, keep in touch, use events like this as an opportunity to, you know, meet new alumni or to create new connections, uh, new friendships. And then of course we have uh, many networking events that happen throughout the, throughout the year. And we, we have such an engaged and strong alumni. And that's something that I believe is just so special and so unique for such a global, um, globally wide uh, reach of, of folks across the globe. So. Uh, something something we definitely want to foster and preserve, and I think something that we're really proud of. Uh, in preparation for today and tomorrow, we, the uh, Alumni Association, uh, collaborated together with uh, the Extension School directly to kind of build a program that, you know, we really hope, you know, shines, you know, a bright light on many of our alumni, also creates networking opportunities for folks to, again, connect with each other, uh, build those relationships so, so incredibly uh, important. Um, and we hope that you kind of take the opportunity and, and you know, network and engage as, as, uh, as you like. For today's symposium, we received an exceptional number of proposals. Um, and we're so thrilled to welcome our, our presenters today. We have, um, each presenter will speak for approximately 20 to 30 minutes. And then we will have an opportunity for Q&A. So we really encourage you to use the Q&A box uh, and myself and then Jill will, will uh, moderate and we'll try to get through uh, the questions um, as efficiently as possible. If we are unable to get to your question, we will be emailing the presenter um, with the contact information. And again, just another way to kind of uh, make connection and, and get to know your fellow alumni even more. Finally, uh, there's we have a virtual photo booth, which uh, is actually we were testing it out a couple of weeks ago, and it's it's really, really impressive. And so I believe Veronica will be dropping that in the chat box shortly. And so it's just an opportunity. It's very simple. Just follow follow the link, follow the instructions, and it's just a really fun way to uh, have sort of a keepsake or a memory from, from our virtual um, experience uh, today and tomorrow. Shortly, we're going to hear from Dean Nancy Coleman, uh, but before we pass it over to her, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Jill Felicio. She is the Director of Advancement at the Harvard University Division of Continuing Education, and I will hand it over to you, Jill. Thank you so much, Susie. I mean, honestly, I don't know what we would do without you and all the work that you have done and the precious time that you have given and sacrificed to bring this reunion to life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And welcome everybody. It's so wonderful uh, to see so many familiar names and new faces and oh, I can't wait till we connect. Uh, but really welcome to our very first virtual alumni weekend. And now I, and I bet many of you are missing the grandeur and the pomp and circumstance of our on-campus alumni weekend. But we hope that this virtual gathering fosters those precious memories, relationships, and learning experience that alumni weekend has come to signify. 
Now, we are delighted that so many of you are joining us for the very first time. And I imagine that it's very helpful to not have the barrier of travel and time restriction. So, you know, we hope that you can come to campus when we do return in person, but this weekend promises to be just extraordinary. Now, COVID has presented so many challenges for everyone this year. But I am so thrilled to report, like Susie mentioned, our community has come together in extraordinary fashion to support one another and foster just unbreakable bonds. We've created uh, dozens of events with Harvard faculty that were focused on incredibly urgent and timely issues. And our alumni regional chapters have fostered bonds, unbreakable social connections, job sharing resources, and frequent events that bring people together in our major cities. We've had some stress relieving and oh so lighthearted events, including a trivia night, a Harvard comedian, um, a screening with the Hasty Pudding Theatricals cast. And we've supported degree candidates with our very first virtual alumni and student mentoring nights, as well as a new mentoring platform called First Hand Advisors. We've also raised critical scholarship funding. So I encourage you, if you have not already joined First Hand Advisors as an advisor, please do so. We've also created advanced career support trainings and job sharing resources. For some of you displaced by COVID, or looking to change careers completely, or just to land your dream job. And thank you all for actively participating and for your unwavering support of one another and our school. Now we have made the absolute best of one of the darkest times in our history, but the future has honestly never been brighter. And the world is now recovering from COVID, slowly at times, but recovering, it's exciting. And the world recognizes the importance of learning technologies, which we've known for decades. And we will soon wake up, welcome the latest cohort of alumni volunteer leadership. We will plan in-person celebrations and foster a new wave of powerful career networks. And we will do all of this under the visionary leadership, guidance, and support of our Dean, Nancy Coleman. Now, before joining Harvard, Nancy was the Associate Provost and Founding Director of Strategic Growth Initiatives at Wellesley College, creating Wellesley Extended, a unit of Wellesley College encompassing summer term, professional and executive education, as well as the Contemporary Women's Leadership Institute, a global program designed to help undergraduates develop leadership skills and find their voice. Now, before joining Wellesley, Nancy was the Vice President at Key Path Education, and the Director of Distance Education for Boston University's Metropolitan College. She is also the current president of UPSIA, which is the University Professional Continuing Education Association, one of the largest continuing education organizations in the world. And Nancy made history here at Harvard just about a year ago, becoming the very first female dean of DCE. So without further ado, let's all welcome Dean Nancy Coleman. Thank you so much, Jill, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Happy Sunday to some of you who are across the globe. I just wanted to, um, to point out before I start my remarks that this is actually my first reunion as well, and I hope it's the first of many, and I hope to be joining you back on campus next year. But just the sheer possibilities that this virtual venue offers to us is really amazing. And, and I wanna thank Susie and Jill and Veronica and Sandra and the many, many organizers and the many volunteers who went into really creating such a fantastic weekend for us. So I'm so thrilled to be here with you and so happy to welcome you to our very first virtual reunion. I thought I just want to take a couple of minutes and give some reflections about what my first year has been as Dean and some of the things that I've seen about uh, the Extension School and DCE and the alumni community and where I hope to take this amazing organization in the future. Um, first of all, I, I just, despite the challenges that we faced in 2020 and 2021, as Jill referenced, I really feel like there's a tremendous amount of light coming out of this darkness. Almost everything that we hold dear is being re-looked at. And you know, we've all heard terms like the new normal and what are things going to be. So I think it's a really exciting time to really 
co-create with all of you and with our students, what does the future look like? And we're really excited for that. I have to really start at the end and that's commencement and virtual the virtual graduation this year. Before our symposium started today, some of us were just reflecting on that. And I have to say, I have never been, so being in higher ed for a number of years now, uh, commencement and graduation day is always my favorite day of the year because it's, it's the day that we get to share with all of you your achievements, but it's the day for me as, as an administrator, really gratifying and really validating about why I chose to be in higher ed. It's just to see people realize the transformation of their lives is really a special moment. And this year was absolutely no different. As I watched both the university and the extension school commencement ceremonies, my heart was just so just so big with pride in our graduates. And I know there are many new graduates, class of 20, class of 21, who are joining us today. And I wanna personally welcome you and welcome you to the alumni family. We're so, so really privileged to be to be among you. We had, for those of you who didn't have a chance to watch it, we had over 1300 graduates this year. And that's the largest graduating class that we've ever had. And in fact, it was the largest, largest graduating class in any of the schools at Harvard. And something else that is a personal milestone for us is there are 63 countries represented. So this is truly a global audience. When I watch some of the student speakers just the achievements that you all have been through, you know, despite having busy lives and other things going on besides your education, it is just remarkable. And I really can't begin any type of alumni conversation without noting how very, very proud I am of all of you. So when I look back on this year, it's been a transformative year for the institution, for many of you, but also for me. And I was last with you, I believe it was last September, just making an introduction about some of the things I was planning to do. So I thought I'd circle back around today and just make a few reflections on what my first year has been like. Um, I, I started with a listening tour when I started last July and I listened to staff. I spoke to every, almost every one of our staff members I spoke to students, I spoke to faculty, and I met many of my fellow colleagues and deans across Harvard. And, I, and what I've really been trying to do is build as many relationships that will benefit us at, uh, at the Extension School and at DCE for many years to come. I am really someone who values communication and transparency and relationship building. And I believe that the more open we are about our plans and our approach and our goals for the future, the more that we can collaborate with other units, other groups to really build it strongly. We are, I'm very pleased to announce, uh, if you haven't heard yet, that we're launching some new programs that I really believe will positively impact our students and our community. A couple of those, I won't mention them all today, but uh, as a new ALM concentration in cybersecurity, uh, much needed. We, um, we had our cybersecurity uh, forum a couple of weeks ago, or maybe last week, time is a blur these days, um, that was virtual. And that's our first annual one that featured our new IT program director, Bruce Wang, and a number of colleagues as well. And that was very well received. We're also launching a new graduate certificate in health and society that's really meant to bring together both public health issues and societal issues, because we really want to, I know many of you are interested in these topics, really help you make a difference and really provide real-time education that's going to move the needle on some of the most important challenges in our world. In summer term, we're looking at building pathway programs uh, potentially expanding Crimson Summer Academy, which, help, which helps underrepresented and underprivileged youths really get into college and make a greater success of themselves. So we're really looking at ways to enhance and redefine some of the programs and services that we offer. As all of you probably know, there are four educational units under the umbrella of the Division of Continuing Education. Harvard Extension, of course, is the biggest one in the, the degree granting unit. We also have professional development programs. We have summer term, as I just referenced, and we have the Harvard Institute for Learning and Retirement. So essentially, someone could start with us as a 15-year-old in our summer programs and our high school programs and continue with us all the way through up to and through their retirement. So that creates an enormous opportunity. 
Um, one of my goals is to figure out how can we bring these units together a lot more holistically because today, although we have the offerings, sometimes if you take a summer class and then you go to register in PDP, you, you have to re-register or we have to do a little bit better about bringing the technology together so everyone is recognized throughout, throughout their lifespan as being part of the DCE community and being able to avail themselves of some of these amazing programs and services. We're also looking at how can we leverage content that might be in one area for another area in different short forms and different ways of organization. And I personally feel that that's really, really exciting, the opportunities there. Um, we're always interested in engaging with the alumni community. If you have ideas for courses or guest speakers or different things that you think we should be doing, we wanna hear from you because you know us best and you can really help us shape what this future is. I'm also really happy to report that um, as Dean, me and some of my senior leadership colleagues have been working on important task forces around Harvard. Like one good example is the future of learning and teaching at Harvard and what that's gonna be like. And we're really able to throw out some pretty innovative ideas that will not only add to the future of teaching and learning, but really build community globally. So with that being said, I'd just like to end with with discussing four major initiatives that we are working on and will be strategic cornerstones for us for the years to come. Um, one is, as I mentioned, bringing our systems together for those four units so that we can truly offer a much more holistic student experience for all of you student and alumni experience. And um, our systems talk better to one another and we'll be able to really engage students at, at a different level and keep people apprised of, of what we have and how they can continue their education with us. That's probably the least sexy of them, but I, I feel it's really something that needs to get done for us to truly offer this holistic experience. Um, the next one is something that has been a personal passion of mine for a really long time. And as many of you know, because many of you are from the international global community, we have, we have a global student base, right? And many of you from other parts of the world have found us, have participated in our programs, but you've done so on our terms, right? And so, and I know I've heard stories about many of you who've gotten up in the middle of the night to take our classes. What I wanna focus this on is what does it truly mean? What is the definition of what it means to be a truly global community for us students? And how can we be much more intentional about supporting you where you are and, of it and, and bringing Harvard to you as much as possible. Um, we wanna be able to meet students and alumni where they are. And that's something that we'll, be look, that we'll be looking at. I don't have the details on that yet. It's still really evolving, but truly building global communities. And even, even as micro, when I talk about that, I'm talking about things like, I heard, for example, from one student who was saying that he was in Singapore and when he was taking a certain class at the extension school, there was another person from Singapore in the class and he didn't even know about it to the last day when that's a missed opportunity, right? Because throughout that whole semester, they could have gotten together for coffee or study group had they chosen to. So we just wanna think more intentionally about how we build that. So we've got title links while you're a student re replicating frankly, how we, how we bring you together as alumni. The second thing is, or actually the third thing is, we're really trying to build, in addition to expanding the programs that we already have, shorter form programs, which might offer, instead of academic credit, a micro credential. Because we know in our system right now, you can come in and you can take a two or three or four day professional development program. And then you could go to the extension school and take a certificate program, but might be four courses that might take you a year or so, but there's really a gap in the middle of that, right? And we know that students are really looking for longer than three-day program and shorter than a certificate program. So we're really being intentional about what types of those programs can we, can we build and offer to our student and alumni community. And last but not least, and something that I would like to, to really engage you all with is, I really want to redefine our employer engagement strategy. We have had, um, I really believe as Harvard, as the Division of Continuing Education, Harvard Extension, it is our job to educate students for the future. 
And as we all know, sometimes the future is uncertain. We don't know with the, the, with the advent and how quickly things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and other things, sustainability and climate change are rolling out. We don't necessarily know what those jobs are going to be even five years from now. So what I wanna do is create a program where we're so much more tightly linked to the employer community, which will really help us determine what are the needs that employers have for Harvard Extension School to be able to prepare students for jobs for the future. So what that means is we'll be rolling out a strategy. And one of the things that I'll be doing is embarking on a listening tour this coming year with employers around the world about what they need and how we can how we can serve them even better. So my charge for you is if you would like us to talk to your organization, if you run an organization, if you're in human resource, have whatever connections and you feel like it would be valuable, please reach out to me, please reach out to the advancement team and just say, hey, I'm interested in this because we wanna to talk to as many employers as possible to really get a picture for what the future is looking like and how we can be a much more engaged partner in that. Let me also caveat that by saying we will never let go of our liberal arts heritage because it is who we are and it is one of the things that we're proud of. And I firmly believe, and I always have, that both liberal arts and job skills are tightly interwoven because that's how we create well-rounded employees and, peop and people of the future. So anyway, we would love to hear from you on this. Please do reach out if we can, um, if, if you would like to engage with us on this. And finally, I'll stop because I know there's probably some questions, but as travel opens back up, I really hope to be out there in the community, to be meeting you, to travel to your location and really meet you in person. So thank you so much for your support and um, happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Nancy. That was such a great sneak peek, you know, like inside baseball of what is happening in the division and what we can look forward to. I mean, micro credentials are, you know, obviously so relevant and such an interesting uh, delineation. We have a question that uh, we've heard before. I don't know if you've heard it before, but Lori asks, um, Lori in Texas, I should say, uh, might there be a doctoral program in the future at HES? Well, Lori, I, I'm going to be honest with you. That's not on the that's not on the short term roadmap. I, I, we've had requests for that. I think we would love to be able to offer a doctoral program, but the way that we're structured right now, we really don't have the right level of support um, to be able to offer doctoral students, and that's a lot of full time faculty advisors and you know rigorous research support. So I will say this. If we were to ever offer a doctoral program, we would absolutely want to do it the right way. So, you know, I'm not going to rule it out, but I don't think it's something that's going to happen in the near term future. But thanks for the question. Great. Um, there is a very specific question about um, an emerging pathway in an ALM program and the potential for a cloud computing concentration. But I wondered if you could uh, just generally address, you know, what ways our academic team goes about thinking about future offerings, concentrations, new programs. Sure, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So we have a number of committees. So at the, at the senior level, we have our new program development committee. And the charge of this committee is to really look at what's going on in the world and what are people talking about? What does the research say that's coming? How do we prepare people for future jobs? So we're always really scanning at a high level what's out there and then trying to match that with who are we as an institution and is this something that we want to be involved in. Um, so that's happening. Also on the individual program levels, the program directors are constantly scanning in their particular in their particular world, what's the new thing? And do we want a concentration in that? You know, in particular IT, um, Bruce Wang, if you haven't had a chance to meet him, he's he's quite spectacular and is very well connected in the community and um, is always looking at bringing on new specializations. And then the third way that we do it is through employer conversations and through even conversations with alumni like you. We need to know what's going on. And I think the best way that we could do that smartly is to be as engaged as possible with the community and the community is a much bigger umbrella. 
So um, all of those things are ways that we that we do it. And we're always, as I said before, always looking for suggestions from you as well. Absolutely. I just want to reiterate, if you have, you know, new avenues of thinking within your industry or emerging issues, you know, emerging technologies, uh, things that you predict will be relevant in the future, we want to hear from you because you've been through these programs and you're amazing advisors, you know, in the future of our, our academic offerings. Um, let's see, here's a question from Ted. Hello, Ted. Uh, we know Ted well. Um, what advice do you have for someone just starting on their career? I think, uh, so first of all, um, do what you're doing now, get involved in your alumni community and reach out and have conversations about things that you're interested in with this group and with other people around the larger Harvard community. There is a, I'm gonna sound like Jill now, but, and we did not program this, but there is a, such a wealth of resources here for you to learn and grow in your career. And that starts with networking. I would also say, Ted, um, one piece of advice that I always give to, um, to folks starting out or even people that are career changes, say yes, right? When opportunities come to you, whether they be volunteer opportunities or opportunities to try something new, just say yes and figure it out later. Because one of the things that I found in my career is saying yes just sometimes puts you in a whole new mindset and opens opens up avenues to things that you never expected if you were to ask me 20 years ago nancy are you going to be the dean of harvard dce i would have said you're crazy that's not and and here i am today right and it's through saying yes and talking to people and just learning about other things so you know without going into a longer answer those are my um quick pieces of advice for you that's awesome. And again, to reiterate, there are so many resources that this alumni community can provide to you. Uh, so really it's, it's alumni supporting alumni and uh, we have so many avenues. So stay involved, get involved. You're here, you're involved, stay involved. Uh, and best of luck, Ted, because I know you have big plans. Uh, now let's see, we have many, many questions and we only really have like a couple of minutes. Um, this is a this is a popular question that is is always on people's minds. The notion of extension studies on a degree uh, mm -hmm. will it be removed in the near or long term future? Asks uh, Gabriel. Yes. So thank you for that question. I haven't heard that before. No, I'm kidding about that. Of course, I've heard that before. Um, let me just say that we are working on conversations about removing extension studies from the degree. Um, I don't want to say more to that. I will say that I have talked to many, many student groups and alums about this, and we have heard how passionately you are interested in us doing that. Uh, and I'm not going to say I disagree with it. Um, I think it's, I think it's definitely something we want to pursue, but there are ways to do that at Harvard and we are following those proper channels. So stay tuned for more information about that as it becomes available. I promise that as soon as there is movement there, we will communicate to the community so that you all know what's happening on that. So thank you for that. That's great. And lastly, what surprised you about the last year? Anything that you, you know, you found as unexpected? Um, yeah, this is going to sound really counterintuitive, but I am, was just surprised by how unbelievably welcoming this community has been. And I said in my opening remarks to you last fall that when the news went out about my appointment on LinkedIn, I had hundreds of people reach out to me, many of whom are from the alumni community to say, hey, welcome, we're so happy to have you. you. You all delved into my background to see, you know, is she worthy of this job? We'll see. And um, that, before I even started at Harvard, I, I was amazed by that and that started me up. And that has continued for the past year. People are interested and engaged and really welcoming. And that has just made it so easy for me. It's not easy to start this job during a pandemic, but I feel like I'm part of the community and, you know, besides the fact that I haven't really spent my, many time, much time in our buildings, that's coming soon. I just, um, the level of engagement and commitment and just welcome, I really, really was surprised by and so appreciate all of you being so gracious to me. So thank you. And I had a different expectation before I, before I joined Harvard. So boy, was I wrong and I'm happy to be wrong. 
Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, our community is as warm and as welcoming and, you know, caring of the future of the division as any school I've ever known. So you, I think, are so uniquely positioned, though, to lead us into the future because you've done this yourself. And I think there is just such a validation and someone coming in who understands what it's like to be a professional learner. I mean, it's it's so hard and you've lived that experience. So that's something that inspires a lot of uh, confidence, I will say, I'm sure, on behalf of everybody, like, thank you for your leadership. And we're so excited for the future and so excited to get out there and meet this fabulous community. You know, where are we going to go first, Jill? We'll have to see, right? That's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, all we hope is that the, the world continues to heal and to rebound from this virus. And then, you know, it, it more such good to come and yeah. such a fun weekend still in store. So thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for sharing, you know, some sneak peeks into what we can look forward to. And um, you know, we will look forward now to our alumni and certificate presenters who have some fabulous topics. Yes. So with that, uh, I'll take it away, Susie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And uh, thank you, Dean Coleman, uh, for your presentation. I can speak on behalf of myself personally and the Alumni Association Board that uh, when you joined and you attended our very first meeting, uh, just your uh, energy and uh, the excitement that you're bringing uh, to, the, you know, the school and to our future, I think is just uh, so powerful. And uh, we're just, we're so grateful for your leadership and all of the exciting things ahead. So thank you for that. So let's kick off this symposium. Uh, we're really excited about our speakers today. Our very first presenter is Dr. William Schnell, uh, or I believe he goes by Bill. Bill is a climate activist at the Climate Reality Project. Um, this is actually led by former Vice President Al Gore. Uh, his topic for today is actually quite timely. It's called Solutions for Climate-Driven Migration. And Bill just uh, the other week, I uh, viewed one of your TED Talks online, and uh, I'm really excited that you are able to join us here in real time uh, and present to us today. So uh, without further ado, please, over to you. What does climate change mean for me? Not for somebody else, not for you, for me. It's always about me. This is how most people approach climate change. How does it affect me? Which is not to say that we are without compassion for people around the world where food security has been severely impacted by a warming world. Uh, closer to home, our hearts go out to those uh, who have suffered the loss of loved ones or property from wildfires on the West Coast or intensifying hurricanes on the Gulf Coast. None of us would wish rising sea levels upon anyone living along the East Coast. But compassion notwithstanding, we are burning record amounts of fossil fuel and emitting record amounts of uh, uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere each and every year. Not even our concern for our children and our grandchildren has diminished our climate destructive behaviors one bit. The only thing that would change our behavior is if climate change started affecting us personally. But here in Northeast Ohio, from where I am presenting, uh, wildfires, hurricanes, and, and rising sea levels do not reach us. Um, temperatures here are increasing and bringing with them uh, certain risks unique to this area. Uh, for example, heat stress in its various forms, um, the incidence of harmful algae blooms on Lake Erie affects the drinking water uh, for Cleveland and Toledo. Toledo had to shut down its uh, water utility a few years ago because of harmful algae blooms. The warming temperatures are providing a habitat for invasive species of ticks, which bring Lyme disease with them. And that is trending upwards in Ohio. 
Being an agricultural state, we've experienced some reduced yields due to uh, wetter springs affecting uh, planting season, followed by uh, drier summers. But nothing, you know, most of the impacts here are, have been manageable so far and are not nearly so dramatic as Cat 5 hurricanes or raging wildfires. However, climate change may be impacting us even here in significant ways that we don't often consider. James Hansen, a NASA atmospheric scientist who first rang the bell before Congress about uh, climate change back in the 1980s, and for that he was dubbed the uh, father of, of climate change awareness, uh, has said of uh, climate forced migration, it is not difficult to imagine that conflicts arising from forced migrations and economic collapse might make the planet ungovernable, threatening the fabric of civilization. In other words, climate change is disproportionately impacting other people in other places, rendering some of those places uninhabitable. Those people have to move somewhere, like here. The threat of mass uncontrolled migration strikes fear into the heart of the heartland. A lot of people around here could be heard chanting not too very long ago, build the wall. Uh, this is a relatively recent development. In 2000, there were only 17 border walls around the world. A mere two, uh, 10 years later, there were 54, excuse me, I'm sorry, there were 45, one of which is uh, winding its way along America's uh, southern border. Uh, it is as if the people of the world are instinctively beginning to feel what climate scientists have been projecting for some time, upwards of 200 million climate-driven migrants by 2050. Given that there are 180 million people living in Mexico and Central America, the prospects quickly become grim should a changing climate uh, adversely affect food security in those tropical and subtropical regions. More on that in just a moment. While it is true that the causes of migration are complex, it is surprising how often a changing climate is a contributing factor, if not the primary factor. We readily accept that climate connection with migration for those of the distant past. Indeed, one of the early migrations of human beings onto the North American continent occurred during an ice age. Then there was a mile high sheet of ice over where I'm seated right now, from water evaporating from the ocean, falling as snow, compacting into ice sheets, rather than running back into the ocean. Uh, that required a lot of water, and sea levels at that time were 300 feet lower than they are today. That exposed the land bridge between the continent of Asia and that of North America, and across that land bridge, the first human beings uh, entered this continent, and later the South American continent as well. Sometimes Climate change has opened up areas to human habitation and flourishing, and other times it has rendered settled areas uninhabitable. Sometimes it has done both at the same place. For example, increased precipitation from regional climate change allowed migrating paleo Indians to settle as agriculturalists in what is now referred to as the Four Corners region of America's Southwest. There they transformed into the thriving Anasazi culture. But when drought conditions returned, uh, the agricultural carrying capacity of the region declined and terrible conflict uh, resulted from those competing for increasingly scarce resources. Uh, ultimately, out-migration ensued, such as a dramatic abandonment 
of the complex of cliff dwellings at Mesa Verde. So we readily accept the climate connection with migration in the past. Why do we not make that connection with today's migrations? Maybe it has something to do with human causation when it comes to climate change and a burden of guilt that we prefer not to bear. But for whatever the reason, today we often explain migration in terms of a, an escape from poverty and violence. That is how the Syrian migration uh, that began in 2011 was explained. And there certainly was plenty of poverty and violence at that time. But we must ask, why did it reach such critical proportions then? What was not so widely reported was that Syria suffered the worst drought in 900 years from 2006 to 2010, one year before the migration began. Coincidence? Or were those caravans uh, of migrants really climate-driven migrants? Here's a picture of that migration. It is from the most commonly found poster promoting the Brexit vote. The number one reason given for the United Kingdom to leave the European Union was to take back control of its open borders with all other constituent nations in the Union. A strong case can be made that without all those climate-driven migrants from Syria, there would not have been enough pressure to force a Brexit referendum in the first place. So when all the dots are connected, a climate event affecting subsistence farmers and other agriculturalists in Syria ends up disrupting one of the world's great international alignments. It is for good reason that the US military has referred to climate change as a threat multiplier. When an unstable country like Syria is already teetering between civilization and anarchy, all it takes is a climate event to tip it over the edge. That can destabilize an entire region, which in turn reverberates far away. Indeed, not only were United Kingdom eyes watching the Syrian migrants with alarm, across the Atlantic Ocean, United States eyes were watching it with alarm as well. In, in fact, the year prior to the Brexit vote, 32 of 50 American states made it quite clear that they would not accept any Syrian refugees. No wonder then, that building a wall became such a compelling issue in America at that time. It became so compelling that the fellow leading the chant was elected president of the United States. And it wasn't long into that new administration when caravans totaling several hundred thousand migrants began making their way from Central America through Mexico and into the United States. True to form, the media from left-leaning CNN to right-leaning uh, Fox News uh, explained the migration as an escape from poverty and violence. What the news failed to mention is how the changing climate of Central America had been dramatically affecting agricultural yields and food security. Nearly every one of the world's countries is ranked according to the Global Climate uh, uh, Risk Index for how they relate with one another in terms of risk due to climate change. Uh, in the uh, study covering the period from 1995 to 2014, the years leading right up to the beginning of the flow of migrants from Central America, Guatemala was ranked out of 184 countries, number 10, as mo most at risk. Nicaragua was ranked fourth, and Honduras was ranked number one. 
coincidence? Or are we seeing climate-driven migrants from Central America as we saw from Syria? If we are, and if they represent the first migration from a place where the carrying capacity of the land is being severely reduced by climate change, then we need to reconsider what passes for walls along our border. We need to rethink cutting off all aid to Central American countries as our president did at the time, which only aggravates um, the poverty and violence that erupt from the competition for increasingly scarce resources. It takes a lot for people to leave their homeland. Home is where the heart is. It's where our language is spoken. It's where our cultural traditions are maintained. But the corollary is also true that it does not take much to help uh, subsistence farmers to remain where they really wish to belong. For example, instead of cutting off aid to Central American countries, we repurpose a fraction of the tens of billions spent annually militarizing our border patrol, uh, building a questionable barrier across all sorts of terrain, uh, and so mismanaging migrant families that we inhumanely and indefinitely separate young children from their parents. Instead of that, we redirect a fraction of that annual expense to fund proven solutions that improve the climate resiliency of small-scale subsistence farmers so that they may remain in place. Now, some solutions, such as the use of old crop residue as a mulch to preserve soil moisture, cost nothing at all beyond uh, instructional ex expenses. Um, other solutions, such as water harvesting systems and small scale irrigation systems that efficiently direct water to the roots of plants, while requiring an initial investment can pay dividends for years to come, not to mention creating jobs to produce, install, and maintain such systems. Further solutions include disease-resistant coffee varieties for the main cash crop of Central America, currently being decimated by a heat-loving disease called coffee rust. Similarly, drought-resistant varieties of staple crops such as Corn and beans are available now. If you'll notice the graphic with the two stands of corn standing next to each other, uh, one is a drought resistant variety and the other is not. What an obvious dis difference. And the same can be said for other stable crops such as uh, uh, beans. Finally, the promotion of crop diversification is an effective adaptation. Plants like dragon fruit, cactus, and sorghum simply need less water to grow. Together, the solutions offered here, along with many other equally cost-effective ones, can improve climate resiliency so that subsistence farmers and their families can stay in place rather than risk a perilous journey as reluctant climate migrants. Climate forced migration is already happening around our world and destination countries are understandably alarmed because it is projected to increase dramatically in the coming decades. As Dr. Hansen has warned, human civilization is at stake, especially when uncontrolled mass migration adversely affects the um, uh, carrying capacity and water security and food security of destination countries are struggling to adapt to a warming world. Right now, and, and that affects all of us regardless of where we live. Now, right now we live in a, an increasingly polarized uh, world. Um, 
where conservatives relative to liberals are alarmed by the migrant crisis while being dismissive of the climate crisis. And liberals, again, by comparison, are alarmed by the um, uh, climate crisis and being dismissive of the migrant crisis. Perhaps this is a place where we can come together and achieve uh, solutions for the climate crisis, uh, excuse me, the migrant crisis, uh, by acknowledging the impacts of the climate crisis. That would be more agreeable and less distressing for everyone. When it's always about me, civilization is in deep trouble. Only when it is about us, all of us, does the fabric of civilization hold together. Thank you for holding it together. And we return to our moderator for your questions and comments. Thank you, Bill. That was, uh, that was incredible. I think you just did such an amazing job of really bringing a balanced perspective on so many sides of when we really think about climate change, you know, the society, environment, population displacement, um, and really those unintended consequences. So thank you for that very, very thoughtful presentation. We do have some questions. And so let me just open up this chat box here. So the first question is, what does the historical record tell us about how our social order might address climate change challenges? <laughs> you know, uh, I'll use a contemporary example, uh, although it can be uh, seen historically as well. Our track record is not that good. As mentioned, Dr. Hansen began ringing the alarm with a congressional testimony in the 1980s. And uh, the result has been a lot of dithering and, and denial, frankly. Um, so we are seeing now uh, signs of hope of, of really taking the climate crisis seriously. And we, we see a, um, a lot of progress being made. Uh, I think a lot of people wonder what I can do uh, as an individual. There's a lot of things we can do on a local level, but this is a global crisis. And uh, what we have seen recently that, that is telling um, is that um, ExxonMobil recently was forced to install some activist members to its board. That came from people becoming aware of this situation um, and letting their voices be heard. That becoming aware um, and then using our voice as we have opportunity seems to me to be a very real way to, uh, for society uh, to address this issue. Uh, I might at this point Point, direct people's attention to uh, the next level for understanding. There, there is a, an interesting series of three uh, articles that were published by the New York Times in conjunction with ProPublica with support from the uh, Pulitzer Center. Um, the first one, if you go to this, just Google this, the Great Climate Migration. This is very acceptable, uh, accessible information that expands upon this topic. And again, there are three, about 40 page articles. Um, I'd, I would encourage uh, our listeners who are interested in exploring this further to go there, the great climate migration. It'll take you to that site. The more we become aware, the more our collective voice brings pressure out of the blue. Who would have thought this even a, a, a couple of years ago, a year ago, that uh, activists, investors to pressure ExxonMobil to explore uh, renewable uh, energy alternatives, you know, would have happened, but it has. So, so I, I guess I have hope uh, tempered by um, a long period of several decades knowing about this and doing nothing. 
Yeah, I know you, uh, you bring a really interesting point because it does feel like there's almost been this seismic shift and maybe in the past 12 to 18 months and you just take, you know, we love sometimes maybe to pick on the oil and gas companies, but, you know, really shifting in how they are putting forward, you know, sustainability measures with, you know, real hardcore KPIs and investors really demanding this information. And so, it's just been really interesting to uh, to see that unfold, and uh, of course, when one when one kind of takes place, it kind of opens up the floodgates for other companies to follow. So, uh, very yeah, very very interesting to to watch. We have one more question. Uh, I would say this leans, I think, a little bit more on the immigration side versus climate change, but uh, I, I'm going to read it out loud. So here we go. Uh, these are great solutions. It seems to me we're already at a place where we have an immigration crisis. How can we help um, people migrating to this country, um, you know, integrate, you know, in, um, in a more, you know, balanced way into our society? And do you have any suggestions for any good sources um, of unbiased data regarding the effects of illegal immigration to the U.S.? So pretty, a pretty hefty question. <laughs> Wow, yeah, there's a lot there to unpack. Um, you know, the solutions that I've offered here, I want to emphasize bias needful time. Um, it, it, around the turn of the century, there were 1% of the land area, uh, the world's land area was uninhabitable. That's projected to be 17% by the year uh, 2070. Uh, this is going to happen. These solutions buy needful time to help us uh, struggle with the, uh, the movement of people from, and parts of America are struggling with, to be, remain hab, uh, habita habitable by human beings. Um, it can only get so hot. Uh, but there are other areas that are going to open up that are amazing. Uh, Siberia is, uh, could become a new breadbasket. Um, the boreal forests now of Canada uh, can also become uh, great agricultural areas as they become warmer. So the movement of populations, the organized movement of populations from Uninhab increasingly uninhabitable parts of Africa, for example, or from Central America, uh, is going to be the key solution. And that, you know, the attitude of, of, of building walls, of, of treating one another inhumanely, I, I just don't see it working when, uh, when we're talking about possibly tens of millions of people. Um, so I, I think we need to change our attitude, see our common humanity, and realize that the influx of, of immigrants, if it's done in an organized fashion, um, can really benefit our country um, in terms of needful labor. But, but I see it not, not just for our country, but, but further up into Canada, uh, especially for subsistence farmers. It, it, these are major mass migration issues. Um, to be smart about it, though, we, I think we have to realize we're all in it together. Uh, it's not us versus them. Otherwise, there, to be quite frank, there's going to be a big dial. I mean, a, <laughs> something we've never experienced before. I, I, I think we'd like to believe that we uh, are capable of better than that. So to kind of address that question of what we, we can do is, is to, uh, um, it's kind of like the pandemic, you know, we, we can all get jabbed here, but if we don't provide for poorer nations, uh, then, then um, other uh, variants arise and come back and it may be resistant to our vaccination. We're all in this together. Seeing that common humanity to me is the key to successfully navigating both the short term, helping people remain in place uh, to buy needful time to establish these mechanisms for um, migrations that must take place from increasingly uninhabitable areas.
Thank you. That was uh, that was a great answer to a very uh, to a very uh, I would say jam packed question. So thank you for that. Just want to remind our participants um, that there are a couple of questions that we have in the chat box. Uh, we will share all of the panelists' emails after. Um, after the session in case you want to follow up. Unfortunately, we, we don't have time to answer all the questions. And then just one final reminder, if you could please include your questions in the Q&A box, that way we can um, follow along and make sure that we don't miss any questions. So just a little, a little housekeeping item there. So we're going to move on now to our second panelist of the morning. Second speaker today is Mar Marsha Huber. She is an ALM journalism graduate uh, just this past year. So congratulations. Marsha has mastered both what I would say the right brain and the left brain. So to describe her, she is an award-winning accounting professor, a well-being and creativity researcher, and a, CP, a CPA and a freelance journalist. So think about that for a minute and just think about how impressive that is. Um, her topic today is findings from a COVID-19 study. What does creativity, gender, or your age have to do with your well-being during challenging times? Uh, of course, a very, very timely topic and we're really excited that Marcia is able to, to join us here today. Okay, hello. Uh, thank you for um, allowing me to speak today. And I hope that I can uh, share some information that will help everybody. And um, of course, I have many more results than, uh, than I can show because I have to keep this uh, you know, rather short. Uh, but first, I wanna start with a bit of gratitude. And is my, uh, my screen sharing right? Oh, I see what I'm doing wrong. Excuse me. There we go. Great. Yep, you're great. Okay. So uh, first, I want to just share a bit of gratitude because this degree has done a lot for me, and I spent about, believe it or not, eight years uh, working on it. You know, you know the whole process, and I just want to say that since I graduated, uh, I have been an accounting professor for 33 years, a tenure professor. And I was just offered a new position as director of research at the Institute of Management Accountants. And one part of it was the degree. And because I will be the managing editor of the uh, Education Case Journal, um, many things I learned in the program allowed me to conduct research such as this. And I also got a book contract on the same day. And what I did is I took a lot of articles that I wrote during my program and constructed um, an outline for a book. So. I am so grateful um, for this degree. So let's get started. Why? Why this study? Okay, well, I am a well being researcher and I had conducted research in the past. And uh, I was taking a course at the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. I had received a scholarship for that. And we had talked about COVID. And our final project was to be related to COVID. And I started thinking about uh, the well-being research I had done in the past. So I thought, okay, I've looked at accountants in the past. I am a CPA. And I thought, well, I'll look at accountants again. But the surveys were not coming in as quickly as I wanted. So I just decided that any group I knew people in, I would contact and try to get surveys. And that is where these results come from. And I do have a degree in creativity. I learned it first at Harvard by taking a course um, with Shelley Carson on creativity, something called Creativity Mad Men and the Harvard Student. And um, that got me going. It was one of the first courses I took. So I grew my interest grew, I studied it. And so I did the survey and I also have a degree in positive psych. So I knew a creativity uh, um, group because I had a degree in that. I knew a positive psychology group because I had a degree in that. And I'll show you the groups I contacted. So what does creativity have to do with well-being? What are some surprises? And maybe I can share with you some practices to help you cope better. So the agenda is to talk about the study, findings, and the implications of those findings. Okay, so 
These are the groups. Uh, the survey actually was conducted in May of 2020, pretty early in the pandemic. We actually plan to do a follow-up when this pandemic is over just to do a, a comparison study. But I included uh, six groups. Number one, the accountants, which I talked about. And then I decided I needed more people. So I contacted our Chamber of Commerce and they allowed me to survey the membership. And then I'm kind of connected with a group of specific group of Christians. I call them the Charismatics and just sent out through social media links. And I got participants there and the positive psychology people that actually have degrees in this. They're University of Pennsylvania alum. Then I have, uh, I'm trained in creativity and that's connected with Buffalo State. So I just sent them something. And then I went through the app next door. And I actually got so many people through next door. And later I'll show you how many people from each group I had. Okay, so the analysis groups uh, or the analyses include age, gender, and group. So we're all some age in this um, at this gathering. Um, we have, you know, uh, I looked at male and female because, of course, that's where I could get the most data and the various groups. And these are the variables, or these are the measures I looked at. Life satisfaction, that is a, a top measure in positive psychology, just, you know, are you finding meaning in life? Are you satisfied with your life and where you are today? Do you uh, have any regrets about where you are today? It's a very simple survey to take. It's only five questions. Then the second one, this is really important, the need for recovery. That is when you get home from work. How much time do you need to recover from your day? Even more interesting is many people work from home during COVID. So, you know, after a day of maybe kids being homeschooled, you're working from home, you know, what happened to this need to recovery? How is that affected by COVID? Another measure is hope. And I'll explain that a little when I get there. Then there's something called positive affect. What are your positive emotions? Then there's something called negative affect. What are your negative emotions? And then I looked at out of the box thinking and some creativity measures. So let's look at age first. And actually the findings that I have are consistent with the literature. Okay, so there's, this is where the cutoff is. 20 year olds and then 50 year olds. And there were significant findings when it came to hope, positivity, negativity, need for recovery, and creativity. There was no difference when it came to life satisfaction. Now I have a few graphs. Okay, so this is that need for recovery. 20 year olds, the higher, the more you have a need. So 20 year olds have higher need to recovery than 50 year olds. And that this, this when, we, when we came to 20 year olds to 50 year olds, that became significant, that difference became significant. And you can also see that the need for recovery decreased as people went to 60 year olds, 70 year olds, 80 year olds. Okay, so why do we care? Well, I'll talk a little bit more why we care about this. These are the positivity and negativity scores. So these scores have to do with your positive and negative affect. It's a, uh, it's called PANIS, and it's a very reliable scale. Again, I use all reliable scales that have been uh, tested um, over the years that are valid and reliable. So positivity and negativity. A lot of people feel like, well, you know, I'm a positive person, I'm a negative person, or I'm an optimist, or I'm a pessimist, or I'm a realist, those type of things. But this is not what these scores measure. We can have positive emotions and negative emotions at the same time. Let me give you an example. Let's say, and I had this happen, my mother passed away. I would be, I would be very sad. I felt very sad that my mother passed away. Those would be kind of negative emotions. But I also have positive emotions. I have joy because as I remember my mother's life or as people tell me about how my mom impacted them, so being void, you know, having positive emotions does not mean you do not have any negative emotions. They coexist at the same time. So what we see here in this graph is, I just put this little picture here. We see, and these are statistically significant again, when we get to 50 or older, 
that the positive emotions for 20 year olds are statistically significantly less than 50 year olds. And the negative emotions for 20 year olds, and that's what we're talking about 20 to 30, are statistically significantly different than the negative emotions of 50 year olds. As you see, this gap is increasing. The wider the gap, I would view that as better well being because you're having more positive emotions and fewer negative emotions. So, this is an interesting finding, and I was questioning, and it's been found we know our young people struggled the most during COVID, but I didn't know exactly why. So I, I was at a, a, another alum thing. That's why these alum things are so important. And I mentioned this finding, and Marty, Marty Seligman, who is at University of Pennsylvania, considered one of the fathers of positive psychology, just, just explained the, uh, why, or why he thought this was happening. And he said, if you look at the theory of human development, that explained people's life cycles. So 20 year olds, when you're 20 to 30, your life is expanding. You're discovering things, you're exercising your skill sets. Maybe you're getting married, maybe you're buying a house, you're socializing, you know, networking. All these things are happening and you're expanding your life. And COVID put a barrier there. And that barrier, when you hit against this barrier, that caused a lot of negative emotions and decreased positive emotions. But as you got older, and my findings found it at the age 50, as you got older, you're constricting your life. You're starting to think about what do I wanna do now that I'm 50 or I'm 60? And COVID provided an opportunity to constrict your life. So maybe you spent time with your grandkids, maybe you got into gardening, maybe you cleaned out the house of all the stuff you wanted to get rid of. So COVID actually helped. And I was like, wow, I didn't, you know, I just didn't understand that, you know, as far as why this difference was found. So another thing I thought about as well, and there was a difference in what we call the hope findings. So hope, what is hope? Hope is being able to see a good future, but not only that, the ways to it. So if you're 20 years old, you have hopes of this great future, and all of a sudden this big barrier came, you're like, you can't see it anymore. But I'm, I'm up there in years, you know, I'm over 50. And then all of a sudden, I can see a good future. I started thinking about retirement. I, I started thinking about the things I want to do and the things I enjoy. So that's probably a partial explanation of what has happened to people regarding age. So next, I want to talk about gender. So when it came to males and females, there is no difference in life satisfaction, no difference in creativity measures. But the big differences were the need for recovery and a positive and negative affect. So the scale is significant, even though it doesn't appear so on this graph. The females had a little bit, it's actually it's significant though. It's just, I couldn't get this graph to work right. The females had lower positive affect and higher negative affect than men. Now, I had this finding with accountants for a survey I did seven years ago, it continued and got worse. So think about the pandemic. Some people really enjoyed working from home. Actually, in my accounting study, men, men loved it. As they got to see the family, um, I interviewed a few men, they got to spend time with their kids for breakfast, came out for lunch, they got to work out. But guess what happened to women? Some women loved it, but I found accounting women did not <laughs> because they had to do their work. Then they had to keep house. Then they had to homeschool the kids. And they were with the kids, nothing wrong with the children, but you know, they just were with the kids all day long, trying to make sure everything's working, trying to keep their jobs. And actually some women in accounting uh, actually said they went back to the office as quickly as possible because they wanted to get their work done. And when they got home, they wanted to spend this time with their families. However, when it was all mixed up, it just caused a lot of stress. So that was kind of one interesting finding that I had in the study. So what are some implications? We also learned, if you look at the literature, women left the workforce um, in what they call droves. Women were affected the most. And this is something, and so my suggestion is that we really need to theorize about interventions to help 
women, all right? Working women, women at home, during times like this, but just generally overall. And then my last group, my last part of the study includes groups. So you'll see the participants, 200 accountants, 94 uh, business owners uh, from our chamber. They gave me their mailing list, the charismatic Christian group, the creativity people, and these creativity people all had um, a certification called Foresight, which I actually took first time at Harvard in a class I took, then the positive psychology alums, then the neighborhood people on next door, and I'm in Northeast Ohio. So of this group, uh, um, 843 uh, gave us usable findings. So let's look at this. Now let's look at creativity. Men and women didn't have a difference in creativity. Um, actually, we did find some differences with age groups, but I didn't focus on that. But I wanna talk about this. So this was statistically significant, uh, or this is satisfaction with life. Uh, there were no real differences in satisfaction with life, except with the neighborhood people, even though this is hard to see. Again, this scale is not good, but um, the neighborhood people were significantly lower than accountants, the charismatics, the creatives, and positive psych communities. And what that tells me is, and we had like 300 neighborhood people, that there's that these types of backgrounds or these type of trainings made a difference than just your ordinary person in your neighborhood. Um, when it came to hope, and I mentioned hope earlier, especially with our young people, the people with the foresight, the creative people and the positive sight people that are trained in these things had statistically significantly higher hope. Then when we look at the positivity and negativity scores, this is very interesting. So when it came to the groups, the neighborhood people had the lowest positive emotions and the highest negative emotions. The two groups, there's actually three groups. The two groups that had the statistical significant difference in these positivity and negative scores, again, were the creativity people and the positive psych people. And then the one group that was statistically significantly different than every other group in negativity scores were these charismatic Christians. And a lot of people don't research, you know, Christians, or may they do spirituality, but this is a very specific group. And I found that interesting that they had the least negative emotions that this is significant than anybody else. So what are the implications? So even though these are such a short set of slides, I believe this shows that those trained in creativity and positive psychology actually had better well-being and more creativity during this very challenging time. Training and learning these type of things is not rocket science. In fact, Harvard offers some of these courses and you can get certificates in this. And these things, according to my research, make a difference. And so when it comes to well-being, not only does creativity, the creativity training and those training of positive psychology make a difference. So I also believe certain religious beliefs can also make a difference or provide a buffer, you know, against what can happen, especially during this pandemic and the way that we handle it. So now I'm open for questions. Thank you so much for listening. I'll figure out how to get out of this. Thank you so much, Marsha. So incredibly timely and, uh, Really interesting data that you've presented. I know, um, I'm sure many of us have just been bombarded with so much information in the last 12 to 18 months, but uh, the way you've presented it, I think is just so easy to consume and, uh, and quite insightful. So thank you for that. Let's start with our questions. Uh, so the first question here is, someone said amazing study, thank you. Did you see the differences between cultures slash races? Well, unfortunately, we do not have data from different cultures or races. We, I don't think we ask race, and we probably should have. Um, it kind of just started out a little bit more of a curious journey, and then it turned into something bigger than that. So, um, and then I had somebody who wanted to do it in Japan. They never got around to it. I had somebody who wanted to do it in Mexico, and they didn't get around to it. And the pandemic is hopefully nearly over. So I can't answer that question for you. 
Yeah, no, I, I'm sure that'll be a, another layer added on uh, as, as time passes. There was uh, an interesting uh, chat happening and one question I believe came up. Um, let me see here. So someone said, I'm just kind of paraphrasing here, but it says, so if the theory is correct, um, I guess, you know, what is your perspective or is it apparently, you know, safe to assume that COVID was a major disruptor to the younger generation, gener generational social pathway? Oh, definitely. I mean, all the research shows that I'm a professor as well. And, um, you know, we had a lot of prep on what's going on with our young people, you know, to be flexible. So many were depressed. So many students wrote me how depressed they were. And I don't think we we had in our pocket interventions to help. You know, it, you know, flexibility is nice, uh, but I really think we could have practiced some positive interventions, just something as simple as a gratitude journal has shown statistically significant improvements in well-being and in a, in a, what do you call it, um, fewer depressive symptoms. You know, so there's just things, three, write three things down at the end of the day and, uh, you know, that are positive, um, you know, calling loved ones, uh, doing something positive for someone. But I did not go to one seminar that mentioned those interventions. And I think that would have been helpful. And it probably can still be used now. I mean, we're coming out of it, but it's, it's a very confusing time because we're going to be back in the classroom again. And, you know, it's another transition. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. It's just, uh, it's endless um, evolving and, and kind of learning from, from the past. So that's, that's great. Uh, next question here is, uh, so someone says, this was done in May 2020. Thoughts on what data might show now in June 2020? 21 with vaccines available. I'm definitely in a different place now that two months into the pandemic now versus yeah. then two months into the pandemic. Yeah, I agree. That's why we're going to do this again. to See if people bounce back. I mean, resilience is the ability to bounce back. So we're just waiting on our timing. Um, my guess is that the young people will bounce back because they have hope again. You know, they have hope, oh, school's coming back, or I can get my job now, and the market is opening up. So I, I have a feeling we're going to see these differences go away. Um, I hope with women, we see these differences go away. So maybe next year, um, have some results of what happened after the pandemic. Yeah, I know. Absolutely. Definitely. It did definitely feel like there's been a bit of a sh shift in terms of, you know, sentiment and energy. Yeah. And so that's just been overall positive to see. I know for me personally, anyway, so that's been good. Uh, someone here asks, I'm curious about social class. I realize this variable also complicates the conversation, but there is a general misunderstanding that those of upper social classes don't experience anxiety or pressure. I'm curious how class may shift this discourse, if at all. Yeah, I think I can address that because, and generally, if, if you, you know, if you measure social class by socioeconomic status or income, research generally shows that at a certain level of income, and this is probably a 10 year ago data, but I have found it consistent in accounting that when somebody gets their safety measures taken, it's like Maslow's hierarchy of, you know, um, whatever the word, Maslow's hierarchy, that once they get to like 40, it was 40,000 like 10 years ago, my research kind of found it floating around 50,000, that once you get those, those measures, your safety, your basic needs met, your well-being still increases uh, as income goes up, but you just have well-being. And I think that ties to socioeconomic class because your needs are met. So when you don't have that basic level of income, all these measures go down. So as people were losing their jobs and accountants, the reason they were consistent as far as satisfaction of life, and even though they weren't statistically significantly different in creativity, and you would not expect accountants to be different, <laughs> I mean, you know, they make the joke, you don't want a creative accountant. Um, so you don't expect, but they were consistent and they were very consistent to the data in the past because I have that data from pre-COVID days. Uh, that's another study that I did. And I actually pulled that data and compared it. That was a different study that I thought might bore the audience because it's about <laughs> accountants. But they're very consistent. And I think that has to do with the income. 
Okay, the accountants did not lose their jobs. They work from home. You know, um, they had and, and accountants, even though they might they some like working from or not, but their satisfaction life was the same and everything was pretty consistent except for women and that need for recovery. Right. Yeah. No, that 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 makes sense. We have uh, time for maybe one more question. Um, so this question says, would be interesting to see if they found coping mechanisms as well. And I wonder if that is in relation to, yeah. Yeah, it, it would be. And, and we can only measure so much, but like I said, I think we can probably uh, when I do the second study, which we're still like, again, maybe in the next two months, you know, try, we have, we ask participants for their emails so we could get a follow-up and then we'll just probably hit the mass again to see how many of our same participants, but just hit the mass again to see what the differences are. Um, yeah. But there we go. But <laughs> I suspect things will change and I hope so. I hope for the better, especially for yeah. our young people and for our, our, our women. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, okay, let's use, okay, now this is officially the last question. We have two more minutes left. Um, well, this starts off quite interesting. So as an accountant, uh, I'll, I'll start this off in an ironic way, but it says, if you were to make a prediction, uh, how will both age groups handle entering back into post-COVID society? I think initially it's gonna be, it's gonna be tough because our young people do not have enough experience. So, you know, here they're going and they're expanding and now this roadblock came and then all of a sudden, you know, it's like I hit a wall and now it's gone. Okay, so I think there might be some regression in their development, but I believe they will catch up. If you know anything about learning theory, which is actually taught at Hugsy, that one part of learning is regression, but you level up. So I suspect, I would predict there would be some regression, though they'll have a little regression and then they'll level up. So, I, you know, I don't know how much time it will take for them to level up, but I believe it will happen based on um, learning theory. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. That was, uh, the, I don't know if you can see, but the chat box is, uh, is quite active and, and so many people really appreciate your insight. So thank you again for joining us here today. Thank you and feel free to contact me. Thank you. So now we're going to shift to our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Giannina Gambini. Again, she is a recent graduate. So congratulations, uh, ALM Management Class of 2021. Giannina is a data expert and the topic of her presentation today is, do we need a new business model for the social media industry? So with that, I will hand it over to Giannina. Thank you so much. Yeah, we'll present here. Let me know if you can see my, um, my slides. Yep, we can see it. Okay, good. So thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, this is a topic I'm truly passionate about. I'm also working on a venture at the iLab. Uh, at Harvard's related to it. So do we need a new business model for the social media industry? Um, I want to start with this slide uh, and I'm going to ask a few questions just for yourself, just to think about it. So the first question is, do you believe uh, Facebook is an ethical company? Just for yourself, just think about that. Um, and now, do you believe Instagram brings value to society? So I want to start with these questions because many of you probably said, nah, uh, I don't know, <laughs> I'm not sure. And because this slide says a lot about the business model we have today with social media and even tech companies, they make billions from you, from me, from us. Like you and I are the reason why those companies are so valuable. I'll talk about more about why later, but now I wanna ask you one more question. Um, how many people, how many brands, how many restaurants, how many local shops, how many friends you have found through social media? And in this case, I wanna say many, right? It's not like those companies are the devil, they're doing something good, right? We connect there. But the question is, is it worth the price? 
because they make billions from you, from me, but guess what? You make nothing or almost nothing while we are being tracked all the time in order to make this to happen. So yeah, um, I'm not a Facebook fan as you might realize it. Um, I use their apps, yes. I use a lot of Instagram and a little bit of disclaimer, I work with Facebook. <laughs> I am the growth manager for the Facebook partner in Latin America. So I know what you might be thinking, but I still believe the whole system needs to change. And this is why I'm here. I'm an advocate of data privacy. I understand social media brings a lot of advantages as we've talked before, but a lot of disadvantages too, like addiction, polarization, isolation, cyberbullying, many. But today I wanna to talk about specifically the business model itself. So social media has changed our lives dramatically, right? Uh, I still remember when I created my first Facebook account when I was in high school and I remember feeling the pressure to join because everyone was there. And I still feel that sometimes, you know, but then I realized later that this is normal. This is a very social uh, thing, right? He being human means we wanna be part of something. But that was a decade ago, that was 10 years ago. And these companies, Facebook, Instagram, Google, Twitter, they have evolved, right? Now it's just not who we connect with, it's what we connect with. And here is the business model of these companies, data. <laughs> it's not entertainment, I'm sorry, they're not Disney. It's actually monetization of data for advertising. We all have individual information that is worth for, let's say Facebook, um, in order to show us targeted ads. So if you didn't know this, every year, depending on your activity and who you are, where you are, you're worth X amount of dollars for these companies. You're literally worth dollars for them. So before talking about why is this a problem, because I guess a lot of people doesn't believe that, I want to think about uh, that mar the market, right? The digital advertisement business model itself. Let's think about size. So last year, um, digital advertisement spending worldwide per year was more than 300 billion, billion with a B. So it contains data, which is one of the most valuable assets nowadays. And it's all because we, what we can do with data, right? We can do targeted advertisement. And that's great. Um, years ago, television and radio, newspapers were everything. But you were paying to get to everyone's attention. And now you can get it to a specific target, the target that you really want to get. So let's say me, female, 24, graduate, we like traveling, uh, I'm interested in tech, I recently purchased something from Apple. Um, all that information that comes from my online activity doesn't belong to me, if you didn't know that, that belongs to these companies. And this is how I would get on Instagram while I'm scrolling and targeted ad about download this tech, blah, blah, blah. So yeah, this is how it works, if you didn't know. Um, it's a very growing market. A few years ago, it has doubled the size in a few years. And in a more few years, in 2024, it's, it's supposed to double again. So yeah, it's growing, it's booming, it's, it's everything, right? So why is this a problem? Because I, when I talk to people, sometimes they say, it's not a problem, but it is. <laughs> so for the internet users, um, I don't know about you, I hate the amount of ads I see online. Like, it's not just the amount of ads, it's irrelevant for me because I did not ask for that. I don't want it, I don't need it, but they're showing me ads because a company pay them to get to my specific profile. It's not because Facebook thinks I might like it. It's not a suggestion, don't believe that. <laughs> I work with them, um, that's false. It's because I'm a target uh, for a company that wants to reach me. So I found, uh, this is because there's a lack of privacy, right? A lot of people are getting this. It's a tracking online world. Everything you do, every post, every story, every like, every comment, every how many seconds you stay on a post, how many seconds you stay stalking your crush on Instagram, on, your, on his story, on her story, that counts to make you a profile for this company. So there's a feeling that this big tech companies like Google, Facebook in general, TikTok, Instagram, they're taking advantage somehow of their, of our data because that belongs to us, right? But it's not just a problem for the users. It's also a problem for the companies because unless you are a company that is doing an amazing campaign online and it's actually a great return of your money, ads are getting really expensive. Like every year it gets more and more, more it's, it's more expensive to actually advertise on social media because Everyone is there. And you as a company want to be there too, to stay relevant, right? The problem is ads are getting less effective. Like 
one of the reasons is because it's a very competitive online market and it's so hard to get people's attentions nowadays. And one of the reasons is because we don't care. We don't, we don't want it. We don't want to give our attention. So I don't know about you. If you're on Instagram, in Twitter, in TikTok, and you see an ad that is not relevant for you, you just keep scrolling, right? And that's money a company pay you to just be in your phone, but you just don't care because it's not relevant to you. So it is a problem, right? But I found something really interesting. I don't know if you know what an ad blocker is. So if you don't know, it's just something that block ads. <laughs> it's super simple. Some of them are free, some of, some of them you have to pay. So 30% of internet users globally use an ad blocker. And that's a lot, 30% in the world that there are internet users. In Europe, there are some countries that more than 50% of, of the country use an ad blocker. In the States, it's like 40. Um, but like in countries like in Africa and Latin America, I am Peruvian, I'm currently living in Lima, there's less than 15% because people don't, don't know about it. So that means people are so annoyed that they're willing to pay to not get advertisement, to not be in track. It's not that you can uh, totally cover or block ads, but you can do it some, on, on some way, right? So they're willing to pay. So that means a lot of advertisement, paid advertisement, is not reaching these audiences. And that is a problem too, because I know I'm saying, putting this in a very bad way, but however, advertisement has a huge value for possible buyers and sellers, all we have. Um, and you might be thinking, why? It connects people, because remember my last questions, you actually have found friends, you have found local shops. Imagine that you found a new restaurant there online and you might like it. And that's a great thing because it connects possible sell buyers and sellers, right? But the problem is uh, the system is unfair right now. It's not worth the price and big companies are gaining more than what we are gaining from our data. So what is the solution? I will, every, every time I talk with someone and they say, okay, that's a problem. So what it is, what should we do? And the question is, I have no idea because yes, it's unfair. Yes, some of us hate it and we hate being tracked. Some of us are paying to not do it. Sometimes some of us are taking actions. You know what? We are more than 7 billion people in the world. And do you know how many Facebook users have in the world? More than three. So half of the world use a Facebook app, Instagram, WhatsApp, whatever. So do you think if I ask them, do you know what monetization means to the half of the world? Do you think the half of the world means what data means? Do you think half of the world understand what monetization of data means? No. And that's the real problem. People don't care. Half of the world don't care. And part of the reason is because they don't understand it. They don't understand what's going on, right? In this alumni, in this Harvard alumni meeting, we can understand what everything in the business model is happening, but half of the world can't. So can we do something about it? Do we even have the power to do something about it? And I think the answer is maybe, but probably not if we do it alone. I don't know if you heard this phrase that says, Facebook is dying and Facebook is just for all people. And <laughs> younger generations, Gen Z hate Facebook. They're never, they're, they, they, they're even killing Instagram because they love TikTok. I love TikTok too. <laughs> so I truly believe the power of taking action as a group is huge, putting pressure to these companies to at least acknowledge that there is a problem and try to do something about it, right? There have been so many scandals, as you might know, about these tech companies, about our data, about breaches, um, that they're just waking up a lot of people about that, younger generations especially. And that's good. That's a good thing. Uh, the newspapers are doing a good thing. <laughs> so the tracking problem can be solved so easily just because it's a good thing if you get targeted ads, but if it's valuable for you, if it's something that you want. So maybe asking just for permission to be interact uh, or just giving part of the monetization back to the user because it's their data, right? So should we protect them? Um, these people, they don't understand what's going on. And I'm gonna say yes. I'm not a big fan of government intervention, but when there's something new in society, when there's a change, when there's an innovation, government has always come up with rules. They're always late and sometimes they're bad. They make it even worse, but they do. So like in television, like smoking, like, like guns. So yeah, we need legislation. We need more legislation than we have. And we have better, we need better legislation, right? Social media is just and actually, Europe is really doing a great thing. They're stepping up. Um, the United States, kind of. 
in countries like mine in Peru, nothing. Like I would say nothing, which is probably almost nothing, but nothing. So <laughs> protecting data privacy, um, I would say, yeah, the states, the government ha have to go and do something right. Actually, Mark Esposito, uh, who is a speaker tomorrow, I believe was one of my professors on AI uh, class last year. I love him. Uh, he's, um, he, I love his thoughts about this. Actually, he also believes it's an unfair game. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I started my own venture. Um, I'm actually think it's an unfair game and that we should give part of the monetization back, which is money to the users because the data belongs to them, right? So what else can we do? Educate people about this topic, about this problem, about how this works. Because don't assume everyone knows what certain topics are just because they're in the same level of education like you don't assume that people sometimes don't care or don't understand what's going on right so let's start with small steps uh download the new ios on apple apple is fighting some, somehow this cause is not allowing for example companies or apps to share data without your permission that's a good thing facebook, facebook is really mad about that really really mad so and the last thing is entrepreneurship right um start doing businesses that challenge them great new business model uh the industry needs that there is a space because there's a problem uh, be, there's people willing to pay for that and this is what i'm doing right uh this is exactly what i want to do with the world I, I want to change i want to make it more fair um so yeah, it's the time to make a change. Uh, it's the time to raise our voice. And, and this is it, right? We, I think we can do a lot of things together, but this is it, if we do it together to actually put pressure on. So yeah, thank you. Uh, more than questions, actually, I would like to hear what everyone thinks about that. It's, it's always nice to hear that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janina. Uh, really great, great presentation. And uh, I personally agree with you in terms of the solutions and uh, the education factor, I think is so, so critically important. And, uh, you know, thinking about how we can start bringing some of that digital lit literacy um, to, to school kids at a younger age, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think you just you just nailed it. So thank you for that. Um, let's get to our questions. So we have a couple here. The first one is regarding social pressure. Do we know if digital slash social media boycotts are effective or have had an impact? <laughs> That's a nice question. I would say yes. Um, I don't know if you are on TikTok. <laughs> this this phrase of Facebook is dying, it's putting a lot of pressure on new generations to actually erase their Facebook accounts. There have been weeks that thousands of people have erased their Facebook accounts, their TikTok, their uh, Instagram accounts. And yeah, I would say yes. Um, again, putting pressure, social pressure is a huge thing, especially now with social media uh, being relevant, <laughs> right? But yeah. Perfect. The next question here is, so it starts off by saying research shows that 60% of all extremist groups members join these groups because of a Facebook recommendation by their algorithms. Here's the question. Have you seen any work to help prevent this from happening, whether from an education level or regulations? That's a huge problem right now. It's not specifically about the business model itself, but yes, I, I've talked with so many Facebook people, especially in the data um, part of it. The algorithm creates a lot of polarizations. It actually just shows you what you already want to see or what you already agree with. And this is a problem because that creates a feeling for you to just believe everyone agrees with me. I, I have I am right, right? And you actually go out in the world, and that's not true. Like you're one percent that believes like that. They're now not doing anything specifically for that. And this is a huge problem. But I would say Facebook is doing a lot of like uh, closing groups that are actually dangerous to society, but now the problem is who says if it is if it's a danger to society because there's a lot of problems right there like politics, and social um, like social problems, countries' interests. So it's it's a huge problem. So uh, they're not doing something great, and now I would say the law is going to force them to do something in a few years. I don't think they will do it because they want to. I think they will do it because they have to. Yeah. No, I think. I think you, uh, I think you might be right about that. <laughs> uh, any other questions in the group chat or in the Q and A box here? I know there was a really 
lively conversation happening and someone referenced uh, the social dilemma. I'm sure you have watched that. And that was very, uh, very frightening <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to watch that. Yeah, I don't know if you have watched it. The Social Dilemma is on Netflix. You should. <laughs> I think like a lot of, I was always talking about this with my friends and family and they were like, okay, yeah, it's a problem, but it, it's just a problem. And then they saw this documentary on Netflix and they were like, oh my God, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny um, because it's a, it's a very great documentary um, on Netflix. It shows that it's not just the business model itself. I've said before, social media has a lot of disadvantages as long as advantages but yeah I, and that's why I think like government needs to step up and actually try to understand what's why it's a good idea to get more legislation about that because why is the um, why is the goal for social media right because it it's now everywhere like I don't know if any of you have never used an, any social media so it, it, it would be weird right Every, everyone is there so I think like yeah we need to make great rules in order to make it work. Well, that's a very interesting comment because it ties into a question we just received. Um, and it starts off by saying, there are positives to Facebook helping create communities, especially during the last year. If not Facebook, then what are the alternatives? Yeah, totally. Uh, I'm not saying I mean that they're the devil. I work with them. <laughs> so, um, and again, I don't know. Uh, I think we need to step up as students, uh, as citizens to actually create solutions. There are a lot of apps now, there are a lot of social media apps that they're actually taking into account data, right? And that's a great thing. They're not that popular. And I think one of the reasons is because people don't understand why is this a problem um, or why is this unfair, right? And that solution, I would say if you, are actually um, thinking about switching or making a change, I would make two suggestions. One is like start using apps that are actually care about their Telegram. There, there are a lot of them, right? They're just not popular, but like force your friends to be there. Like just, just try it. And the second is create ventures that actually challenge them, right? They might not become multi-billionaire companies, but there actually will be a pressure in society that we need a change, so yeah. That's, that's great. We're just uh, we're reading the questions here as they come in. So this next question asks, why not adjust the algorithm to mix in, quote unquote, 20 to 30 percent contrary views based on sentiment analysis of the political slash social views? This might reduce the echo chamber effect. That's yeah, I, I thought was why could be one of the solutions too. That's for the polarization point of view. But I understand they take decisions, not just because what's good for society, but what is good for their business. Like their stakeholders are there to make money. So they're always going to create a biz, uh, an algorithm that actually keeps you in the app. And that means as everyone, we all like to be right. We all like to be in our phones them just to assure us that we are in a good path. And if we do, if, if we do what we say, I might think a lot of users are going to get annoyed and just change the channel. Like when you're in, in TV and you don't like something, you just change the channel. And that might happen on Facebook. They, if you see, if you start seeing something that you don't agree with and you're this specific type of profile that they want to be right, that is a lot of people in the world, um, you might just like escape Facebook and go to Twitter or go to somewhere else. And that's not good for business for them. And that is not a decision that they might take. And so that's why I'm always say they're not going to change because they want to. They're going to change because they have to. I think the government is going to make, I mean, they're actually fighting kind of legally now, um, but I think it's going to step up like a way more, uh, in a way more bigger world, kind of. So, but yeah, I think it's not just, we cannot force them to change their algorithm because that's part of their business. But I would love that. I, I would love it to be like that. Yeah, no, all, all very good points. This next question is, uh, so let me see here. So it says, what do you think about China's social credit system, which takes the tracking of behavior to a whole other level? Yeah, <laughs> um, if I don't like Facebook apps, <laughs> I truly don't like Chinese apps, right? Um, 
I met some Chinese friends and they said sometimes when they talk in on their like WeChat and other apps that they have, they, they usually don't use Facebook companies apps. Um, sometimes they're talking something bad about the government and the message gets erased. Like <laughs> they, they cannot talk about that a lot, but it's very creepy what's going on there. And I don't know if, if the government should step up until that um, level, I think that's dangerous because we need freedom. But I think it's a very difficult conversation, right? Um, it should actually, I mean, they should work with the law just until a very, into a line that is gives you freedom, but also like try to make a society a better place, right? Because that's that's why the government is there. But yeah, I don't think at all that we should go to the, the that limit that China is doing, right? That I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like living in in a place like that if that's what is happening. Yeah, no, that would be that would be a, an extreme shift that I I don't know, uh, don't know how uh, we would we would make sense of that. So um, just trying to see here, any other questions? Just going through the chat here. Everyone is just. Thanking you for such a great presentation, high energy, eye opening. Uh, so thank you very, very much. This was this was fantastic, and uh, we're we're just so pleased that you were able to join us today. So thank you. Thank you. All. Bye. So now we are uh, going to our final presentation of the of the morning. And our next speaker is Anne Rush. She is an ALM uh, and management graduate, class of 2015, same, same year I graduated, Anne, so I don't know if we ever crossed paths at all. Uh, her topic is uh, timely on its own, but I think even more timely given the past you know, 12 to 18 months when we think about COVID and, and the impact that it's really had on, on people working, you know, kind of assessing in terms of like where they are in their life, where, what they want to do with their career. And so we're so, so excited that uh, you're able to join us here today, Anne. The topic is called freelancing and the future of work. So without further ado, over to you, Anne. Yes, thanks so much for having me. I'll pull my slides up here. Um, uh, can I just I believe you can probably see them. Yes, we can. Excellent. All right. Well, I will jump right in. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I don't know how I ended up going last following all these uh, great speakers and, and such interesting and, and engaging uh, material. Um, so uh, hopefully I can uh, rise to the occasion. Um, as Susie mentioned, I graduated from the management program in 2015. Um, and I actually recently made a, a pretty significant career change. I left my job at a Fortune 100 company and I launched a startup, Elasta Jobs, uh, which is a digital marketplace for freelancers. Um, and you might be wondering, as did my family and friends, what, uh, what sort of drove me to go from a, a very stable job at a company of 45,000 plus employees to a company of one. Um, and that's actually what I'm here to talk with you about today. It's um, essentially how freelancing factors into the future of work. So if we look around, we see that the definition of when, how, and where we work is rapidly changing. Um, you know, as Susie said in, in the kind of the tee up, the last uh, 18 months have certainly accelerated uh, that, the pace of change. Companies um, have a growing need for flexible talent on demand and are increasingly, increasingly excuse me, more comfortable with remote and off hours work. To remain competitive, companies need to leverage independent talent, not just as a cost savings lever, but as a critical and strategic part of their overall talent needs. Startups and small businesses have been comfortable with this model for some time. It's a great fit for securing talent for specific needs and only paying for what you need. Um, however, mid-sized and large companies are also realizing um, how the freelancing economy um, brings scalability, flexibility, and diversity of thought to companies of all sizes. When we look at the um, independent talent, 
The freelancing economy provides flexibility and the ability to choose their work assignments. Um, too often an afterthought, uh, freelancing also offers the individual development and career growth, which is a very real and tangible benefit. Um, these individuals gain experiences across industries and, and highly sought after skills can be applied to new types of work. By the nature of the work, freelancers are continuously learning and are more likely to have a growth mindset. Companies realize large benefits from the varied experiences um, and diversity of thought that this brings. The freelancing economy provides measurable benefits to companies, independent talent, and, and the overall US and, and, and global economy for that matter. Um, according to a January Forbes article, in 2020, 2 million workers joined the freelance economy, raising the percentage of American workers engaged in freelancing by 8% to a, what I think is astounding, <laughs> a total of 36%. Um, the freelance sector has grown to generate 1.2 trillion in income annually. Um, and at HBS, uh, there's an initiative underway to understand the future of work. Contingent workforces in the gig economy are considered one of the six key forces redefining the future of work. In the study, Building the On-Demand Workforce, um, a team led by Professor Joseph Fuller, found that many company leaders, uh, about 60%, reported that it was highly or somewhat possible that their core workforce in the future would be much smaller. Similarly, 60% expected that they would increasingly prefer to rent, borrow, or share talent with other companies. COVID has certainly accelerated the need on both sides for the freelancing economy. Freelancing is a mutually beneficial undertaking for both independent talent and companies. And while I may be just getting started with Elasta Jobs, uh, my journey exploring the future of work occurred organically as I've grown my career. Uh, before I dive in further and share what I've learned along the way, um, I'd like to pause here and pull the audience to get a feel for how many people have worked with freelancers um, and potentially engaged in freelancing yourselves in the past. Um, I won't ask generically how many of you uh, have worked with gig workers, as I'm sure the answer would be nearly 100% <laughs> if we include Uber and Lyft. Um, but I am curious how many of you have worked with freelancers or consultants in a professional setting. Um, so I see the, the polls kind of coming in. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, read the first question as I give folks a, another minute or two to respond. Um, have you ever worked with a freelancer or independent consultant in your professional setting? Um, so it looks like it, it's about 73%, 74% yes. Um, and then the second question, have you ever engaged in freelancing or consulting? Um, and it looks like this is actually hovering around um, the, the high 60s as well. Um, so thank you for those who took the time to, to answer the poll. Um, that's super interesting, um, not particularly surprising to me. Um, and actually, I feel like at this point, um, this audience may know um, as much as I do about the importance of freelancing. Um, and I'm looking forward to the networking events coming up this evening and, and tomorrow um, to chat with some of you about your experiences. Um, in the meantime, though, I'd love to share my experiences um, uh, with you around the key benefits that I see of freelancing, um, which includes uh, scalability, flexibility, and diversity of thought. So I want to start with scalability. Uh, for large companies without an outsourcing model, cost savings and scalability are often the first problems to address with a contingent workforce. During my career, I supported call centers as both an HR leader and an operations leader, and I saw the necessity firsthand of having scalable talent. Capacity management in a call center is complex and data driven. You know from historical trends how many calls to expect, depending on the time of day, day of week, month, season. You also know the skills, schedule, and location of who works for you. It's not um, necessarily cost effective to staff to the peak. So you have to take into consideration all of these factors 
um, and the workforce that you have and, and staff to the mean instead of staffing to the peak. Um, and it is feasible, albeit probably not most effective to staff that way internally. Um, however, when I ask yourself, what happens when a hurricane hits? And um, I, coming from the insurance industry in my past, I actually mean this quite literally. Uh, suddenly your call volumes increase exponentially. If you don't have a model that scales on demand, you won't be able to service your customers when they most need service. Now, certainly not all examples for the necessity of scalability are quite so dramatic, uh, but scalability certainly remains a key and critical benefit of freelancing for businesses. In addition to the call center example I provided, uh, companies also need scalability in more highly skilled fields, such as HR, project management, and finance. Um, and judging from the poll results, um, I suspect that many of you have probably interacted with, with these types of freelancers in the past. Um, as you consider the increasing parental leaves offered in many states here in the US, um, it can be difficult as a manager to cover upwards of five months of leave for an employee. Um, many countries with more generous parental leave policies, uh, such as Canada um, and, and many others, they already have a strong work culture of leveraging professional freelancers. Um, so the need for scalable talent um, comes, comes in a lot of different pockets and will continue to grow in the US. Um, and I do think we'll see a greater uptake on professional freelancers across a variety of fields. So next we have flexibility, um, and you don't have to look back far for a worldwide lesson in the importance of flexibility in the workplace. And I know Marcia spoke um, about, uh, about this as well and, and um, the impact of working remotely and the impact to women. Um, the global pandemic asked companies to shift overnight to a fully remote workforce, um, but not every industry nor company was able to respond uh, with re remote work for their employees. Caregivers needed greater flexibility, and this led millions to leave the workforce. Um, unfortunately, this did hit women harder, um, as women were 20 times more likely to leave the workforce than men during COVID. So to create and maintain a diverse workforce, uh, flexibility is required. And there are a few key enablers to workplace flexibility. The right technology to enable fully remote work is first. Um, however critical this is, it's not just enough to be able to connect remotely though. We have to think about the experience of the workforce. How do workers collaborate with each other? How do managers lead in a remote environment? My role had uh, recently changed prior to COVID um, and I was the leader of Liberty Mutual, which is an insurance company's global employee digital experience. Um, in general, HR technology uh, can frequently be underfunded as it's often the first place to look for cost reductions. Um, people generally think the experience needs to be okay, um, but not necessarily great. Um, however, I didn't agree that that was the right approach. If we're thinking digital first, we need to think digital first for our workforce as well. Uh, the digital experience is an essential and growing piece of the overall workforce experience. By centralizing the technology product owners onto my team in early 2020, we were able to overcome functional silos and, and look holistically at the full digital experience we were creating for our workforce. Um, COVID increased, <laughs> certainly increased the focus um, on the workforce's digital experience as a critical enabler of successfully working remotely. Collaborating, staying true to the culture, fostering a sense of team all needed to happen digitally. These were areas we worked to make quick, quick progress on in 2020 to respond to our workforce's needs. Beyond just the digital tools, COVID accelerated the need to think about how to manage a remote workforce. Responding to COVID helped leaders at all levels learn to motivate teams, onboard new employees, and collaborate remotely. Now that we've acquired these skills and are building on them, some of the barriers to stronger utilization of freelancers or a contingent workforce have been removed. The need for flexibility is definitely here to stay and companies need to consider this as they create their workforce models in the future. Of freelancers surveyed by FlexJobs, 89% said that they chose the, to join the gig economy because it offered better work-life balance. 
Companies need to be planful and continue to improve their ability to offer work flexibility for employees and, and freelancers alike. The third benefit that I see of freelancing is all around the diversity of thought that freelancers bring to their work. Freelancers benefit from applying their skills across a variety of industries, as well as applying their skills to unique work assignments. Outside of freelancing, it is very difficult to get this level of career building and learning. Companies also benefit from this. Freelancers bring these skills as well as a fresh perspective with them. They bring diversity of thought to the teams they work on. Companies need to think about how they can fully leverage this benefit and how they break up work assignments for freelancers. I've had several points in my career in which I saw the benefits of short-term assignments, um, such as you might use a freelancer for. Several years ago, I took a role leading a campus recruiting team, and we built out a new rotational program for MBAs. Before taking on the role, I definitely understood the value that the um, employee or, or new, new MBA got from those six to nine month rotations across the various areas of the business. What, a, what an awesome learning opportunity. Um, however, uh, when, when designing the program, I began to realize um, and see firsthand the benefits that the departments that hosted one of the development program participants received. Um, the individual brought a fresh perspective. They thought about things differently than those who had been on the team for several years. Then later in my career, I worked in technology product management during an agile transformation. I saw that working in an agile way can be an enabler to engaging with freelancing talent. Projects don't need to be approached for two to three years or managed for two to three years. Work can be broken down into a minimum viable product with epics and sprints. In addition, teams can be self-governing around each sprint and assign work accordingly. This approach enables the group to understand the skills and knowledge that is needed and then match that with the team members and assign work accordingly. It, it's also a great model for um, enabling freelancing because even if the freelancers don't have institutional knowledge, they can successfully contribute to an agile project um, and bring their fresh perspectives um, and things they've seen at, at other companies. Um, in fact, given the variety of their past work assignments, the freelancer may be able to bring more innovative thinking uh, than even an insular team would. So as we look toward the future of work, we're going to uh, see companies more frequently integrating freelancers into their overall workforce plans. Digital marketplaces, uh, such as ElastaJobs, uh, make this process easier to the benefit of freelancers and companies alike. The marketplace concept enables companies to find the skills they need on demand, and freelancers get access to a wider variety of work opportunities. As the number of contingent workers grow further from the 36% it is today, freelancers will become a larger component of the future of work. As I've realized through my career, companies need to be focused on scalability, flexibility, and having a diverse talent pool. Meanwhile, workers are seeking greater flexibility and a challenging and rewarding career. The growth of freelancing is this intersection. So that uh, kind of concludes my overall presentation and I'll see what questions we have. Thank you so much, Anne. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Really, really enjoyed that. Thank you. Absolutely. Let's jump into some questions here. So someone said, love the agile approach. I was wondering how, oh, this is a good question. I was wondering how institutional knowledge would be addressed. Yeah, it, it, that actually is a great question. And it's really important. Um, so while I think freelancers bring a ton of benefits to companies that they work with, um, it's also really important for the company to think about um, how do they onboard the freelancer enough so that they can truly add value? Um, and, um, you know, I know in some instances, companies are thinking, gosh, this is a freelancer. They're not going to be here long. I don't want to devote the time 
to bringing them on. But the, there is some level of, you know, institutional knowledge or onboarding that needs to happen. Um, and it's, it's kind of difficult to provide a generic answer because, of course, it depends on the, the company. It depends on um, what you, uh, what the work assignment is, um, you know, et cetera. But um, I do recommend to companies um, and they can you typically leverage whatever they have for an employee onboarding packet. So if you already have an employee onboarding packet that you know shares um, at a glance your company values, your team norms, all that great stuff, you know why not provide it to the to the freelancer as well, um, so that at a minimum um, the freelancer can kind of get up to speed um, to the level that a, a new employee would be, um, and then. You know, the freelancer is going to most likely either need to work to be and be part of a team that will have that institutional knowledge or the um, work product that the freelancer produces is going to need to be pretty specific um, so that the company can kind of just take that and then insert it back in um, into the overall project. So there are a few different approaches, but it's a, it, to, to your point, Susie, it's a great question um, and it is really important um, aspect. Yeah, I know that's uh, I never thought about that, but it's almost like thinking about some type of like speed pass for, you know, freelancers or what does that experience look like? So, yeah, I, I thought that was that was very interesting. Uh, next question here says one of the stumbling blocks that prevents people from doing freelancing is the need to uh, oh, is the need for affordable health care, at least in the U.S. What have you seen people do to be able to. Um, to, to do as freelance while maintaining their health care. Yeah, it's it's an excellent point. And you know, when I mentioned earlier that we see other countries um, leveraging freelancers more um, to cover things like parental leaves and that kind of thing, most of those other countries that I'm referring to also have um, social health care. Um, and so um, uh, one of the things, so I have the benefit of being in Massachusetts. Um, so we've had, um, you know, mass health for um, available to us for some time. Um, it, it is a problem. Um, typically what people do today is um, that's kind of addressed in the rate that the freelancer um, asks for. Um, so you, if you leave a company to freelance full time, um, you shouldn't just ask for, say, your base salary, right, that you were being paid previously, because the, the value to you um, was much higher because you had um, health care and you had other, you know, you have paid vacation and other benefits. So um, you need to take that into account when you're establishing your rates. Um, and um, companies expect that too. They, they know they're going to pay, um, you know, actually it's not overall more because again, for an employee, they're paying for that as well, but they, they do expect um, you to, you know, have a bit higher rate because you're covering a lot of things that, um, that a company would normally provide for, for an employee. So um, I don't have the answer to, to healthcare. I, I wish I did. I, it's, it's definitely a, an area that, um, you know, kind of outside of, of the last of jobs, I, I feel very passionately about that we need access to healthcare and, and, and mental health in, in particular is an, an area of interest of mine. Um, so I don't have that solved, but I, it is important to um, consider when um, at least establishing your rates as a freelancer. Yeah, no, if you happen to ever crack that code, Anne, <laughs> please, come please back come back. <laughs> you can have Absolutely. all three hours to yourself. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, next question here is, uh, and just heads up to everyone following the chat and the, the Q&A box. So trying to, trying to get through this. So uh, thanks for your patience. Next question is, do you see a greater need for freelance generalists or freelance specialists in the future of work? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it probably depends on where people are in their career. Um, I think in general, companies are already um, leveraging, I guess, freelance generalists. Um, so that might be um, a bit more junior level 
um, kind of a jack of all trades. I can run reports. I can, you know, create PowerPoints. I can manage projects. I can, um, and um, I think a lot of companies are are using those today, um, and will continue to do so. And, and it probably will grow to to some extent. Um, the other area that I think is going to perhaps grow even further are those specialized skills. Um, in particular, uh, you know, if you think about smaller companies um, or even large companies that are based in um, areas of the country that maybe um, aren't as populated or um, those companies are going to be looking to hire for a particular skill set, um, data science as an example, data analytics. Um, and they may not um, be able to afford to uh, hire someone full-time or they may not be able to attract um, someone to come and you know, live in that area of the country. And so I think we're gonna see a lot more um, specialized freelancing and some of these key fields um, where, you know, back to, to my earlier quote of the um, on building the on-demand workforce uh, study being done at HBS, you know, the, that, that mindset of, hey, I can, I can sort of quote unquote rent my, my talent in this key area um, and fill this need um, without trying to, you know, build up a full team internally. So um, that was a long answer, but I guess I would say probably the specialized freelancing growing at a, a bit faster pace than, than overall, but I think both are going to grow. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you um, because I, you know, to me, I always thought freelancing was just this specialized skill and, you know, you were going to go kind of out of your way and maybe disrupt a little bit internally to bring that person in. Um, but just recently at work, we needed uh, just a, a project manager who mm -hmm. could just come in and doesn't even need to be a subject matter expert when it comes right. to the matter, but knows how to keep people on time, manage budgets. And uh, it was just work that we had secured and it, we just didn't have capacity. And so um, just so interesting to see that there, the freelance spectrum is, is just so broad. So that was really mm -hmm. interesting. Absolutely. Um, this next question here is, um, here we go. How would government actually manage freelancers in terms of taxing issues? So the freelancer is, um, is independent. Um, and um, some freelancers will set up um, like an LLC or a, a proprietorship um, in their own name to um, distinguish between, you know, this is this is me as a person and this is me as a company. But but if you if you have a proprietorship or an LLC, you um, you can include the taxes with your individual taxes. I'm speaking to the US, I, I'll be honest, outside of the US, I, I don't know how freelancer taxes work. Um, but within the US, um, it's the responsibility of the of the freelancer, um, him or herself, to um, to understand and, and to, to, you know, to file the, the income that's earned and, and pay the taxes. Um, and I think, you know, even for those who set up a LLC or something to just protect their personal assets, um, they typically do their taxes, though, through their, their personal taxes. Great. We're just going through these questions. There's so many. Um, great. I this love is it. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I want to make sure I get it in as many as possible. So <laughs> next question here is, uh, thoughts on what sounds like a decrease in deep work relationship for freelancers? Would this contribute to workers feeling more disconnected because they may not have a stable or supportive work family? Really good question. That is an that is an excellent question. Um, yeah, I, I think it's 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 an interesting one. So I, I guess I have two thoughts there. I think one is um, you know freelancing is definitely not for for everyone. I would say just like you know, maybe working remotely. Once, 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 once we're able to go back to the workplace, <laughs> working remotely is not for everyone either. Um, I personally loved it um, and still do. Um, but, um, you know, I think um, if you're truly 
an extrovert and, you know, you um, really love that sense of team and camaraderie at the company where you work, um, then striking out for, um, you know, and trying freelancing might not be the, might not be the best fit. Um, that being said, um, you know, one of the ideas that I have, and, and again, very early stages, um, but the, I haven't seen a lot of freelancing. There are a few out there, um, Facebook or, or LinkedIn, but like freelancing communities that support each other. Um, but one of the aspects that I'm hoping to achieve with Elasta Jobs is actually creating um, a, a sense of community. Now, again, it's online, um, but, uh, but that sense of community of, um, hey, why don't you, um, anyone's welcome to post, people can kind of post their, their best practices or their thoughts and almost create that, um, a bit of that sense of community um, amongst the, the freelancers. But I'd say um, just in general, you probably need to be more proactive in your networking, more proactive in creating those senses of community um, than you might need, might need to do at a, um, you know, regular um, company. Yeah, I know. And you, you brought up a really good point too, right? Like sometimes it's just about your individual needs of how you're going to thrive in the, in the workforce. And so we kind of saw a lot of that, you know, come, come to light in the past year or so in terms of what, how people, you know, what they needed to thrive, what worked for them, what didn't work for them. So it was definitely a, um, I would say a lesson in so many ways, but it definitely, I think, crystallized in terms of, you know, what, how, how we prefer to work uh, in the workforce. Absolutely. This next question here says, uh, let me see here. Specialist employees are often contractually excluded from working in the same industry for some time when resigning. How is this handled when hiring shorter term specialist freelancers? So I would say that you probably want to talk to an attorney um, if you're concerned. Um, so yes, that's true. Um, most companies have, um, you know, some type of agreement that you probably sign annually um, when you get your bonus that, um, you know, says either I won't, you know, I won't attract people away from the company. I also won't work in the same industry. Um, and so I would say that that would be something that just like you would do if you were taking a new um, job at another company that you were a little bit concerned about, it might be on the, on the fence. Um, I would sort of think about it in the, in the same way, um, you know, just to err on the side of caution. I'm not an attorney, so I, I, I couldn't really offer more than, more than that. Great. Uh, just going through the chat here. No more. Any other questions? Anybody? I know we, we covered a lot actually, so yeah. <laughs> we don't want to, we don't want to wear you out, but no, lots of wonderful. really, really good conversation in the chat and just lots of people just thanking you for the presentation, lots of good comments. Great. So yeah, I know this was, this was great. Thank you so much. This was, uh, again just so timely and uh by 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 all the questions uh no doubt that lots of lots of interest in this topic <laughs> yeah absolutely glad to be here thank you thanks very much well i just want to chime in and just thank every presenter because you guys were just incredible and you've given us so much to think about and thank you susie for being such a fabulous moderator of those questions my gosh i mean i'm just speechless well, Amazing. the the topics were like I said, the topics were just so relevant, so timely. Presenters were presenters made it really easy uh, when when uh, the topic again was just so uh, so good. Everything everything just worked out really well. So thank you to everyone. Yes, absolutely. I mean, what a wonderful way to get this weekend started. And uh, we have just dropped links in the chat for our next couple of events. So if you check it out, there are direct links also by email that were sent to you yesterday and I believe again this morning. So, you know, we will see you for a Fog Art Museum uh, 
tour and then we will gather back on Zoom to meet the board of directors and some of our wonderful chapter leadership. And we can um, ask them all about what they're thinking, what they've planned over this last year and where they see that board headed. And we are in an election cycle. So there's so much to talk about. And Susie, thank you for serving on that board for the last several years and putting so much hard work into making this event so successful. Oh, well, Jill, thank you to you and your team uh, is, like I said, just so collaborative uh, and just so fantastic. And uh, I'm just so grateful of all the relationships that I've built along the way. And uh, I know it, it won't end after my, my term uh, is over. So thank you. Oh, amazing. And you managed this in the middle of a move. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yes. I so it. I have like Jeez. boxes and just stuff shoved right here. I'm like touching it right here. <laughs> so I tried to clear, clear the background to make it at least somewhat presentable. And I was, I was trying to adjust the lighting. So, uh, I don't know, yep. I don't know what's going on, but I'm here. I'm, I was present. I'm, and, uh, like I said, everyone, everyone was so fantastic and, uh, you can't see, can't see what the chaos that's happening here. So hopefully it didn't, it didn't come through. <laughs> No, I mean, I let the cat out of the bag, but talk about <laughs> resiliency and adaptability. That's what our community has in common. You just get it done, right? Yep, absolutely, absolutely. All right, well, thanks everybody. We are gonna conclude this session and we'll see you at the next. Thanks everyone.